Hey everybody, welcome to the last segment. And I'll just tell you straight up here, um, this stuff is not on the AP curriculum, so it's not gonna be uh, on test. Uh, so it's just stuff that I think is interesting and is relevant and uh, stuff you may be dealing with uh, if you go into studying biology in college, so it's worth looking at. First, we'll talk about the idea of cloning. Now cloning can just be copying a, a, a single gene uh, but a lot of times, again, when people are thinking about cloning, they're thinking about reproductive cloning where you take an entirely new organism. Okay, so let's look at uh, how that sort of cloning can work. Um, what you'll do is uh, you do the somatic cell transfer. So you take a, a body cell. Uh, the first uh, animal to be cloned was a sheep called Dolly. So there's a, an image of Dolly. But what they did was they had uh, a donor cell. Uh, taken from the mammary glands of a sheep. And then they took a donor egg from another sheep and removed the nucleus from that donor egg. Then they were able to get the nucleus from the mammary gland cell into that donor egg. So it's basically like taking the DNA out of an egg. Because remember, an egg is going to be haploid, right? And then they take the diploid nucleus from a donor cell, a somatic cell, and put it in the egg. And then they stimulate the uh, egg to divide, creating an embryo. And then they just implant the embryo into a third sheep uh, that will sort of carry uh, the offspring, in this case, uh, Dolly. Okay. So again, you have a donor egg, you take the nucleus out, you have a donor somatic cell that has a diploid nucleus. You get the diploid nucleus inside the once empty donor egg. You stimulate the egg to divide to create an embryo, and then boom, you get a brand new organism. Okay. Uh, now, this leads to all sorts of interesting things. Uh, one is somatic cells have DNA that's already been copied, right? And we know that when you copy DNA, the telomeres shorten. So if you take uh, a nucleus from a somatic cell, it's already going to have chromosomes that have been shortened. So one effect of cloned organisms is that they tend to have shorter lifespans. Like Dolly didn't live as long uh, as a normal sheep because Dolly got DNA that already had his telomere shortened. So that's one of the issues that we have with reproductive cloning. Another thing to keep in mind uh, is that gene expression is not 100% controlled by genetic inheritance. Environment plays a, a role in that and that you can randomly shut down different chromosomes. Uh, here is CC, uh, the first cloned cat. CC, I think of like carbon copy. Uh, so CC did not look like uh, the, the donor cat, um, even though uh, they have genetic information that's identical. And a fascinating example of this is a, a bull called Chance. Um, this is a uh, uh, a piece that I saw on uh, This American Life uh, a number of years ago. There was a bull that lived down in Texas long, long ago. Uh, its name was Chance. And uh, the bull was really docile. Like the people would walk it around on a leash. The bull would like go in their house. They'd take it around there. You see a picture of like kids sitting on this bull. So it was a, a really great bull. The owners absolutely loved the bull. But then, you know, what bulls do, they, they died. Okay. So chance died and the owner of chance was absolutely devastated to have lost this, you know, great bull. So, uh, he saw that at one of the universities in Texas, it may have been Texas A&M, they had cloning as a possibility. So he had kept the hide of chance, this bull, and then he, they were able to take tissue samples for that and get DNA from the tissues of chance and then use that in a donor egg to create a clone of chance appropriately named second chance. Okay. So here is second chance, the bull. And even though it's a genetic clone of the original bull, second chance had a personality that was way different. This bull was much more aggressive. I uh, couldn't be around uh, people um, when I was, you know, in this sort of documentary I was watching, um, the bull actually gored the guy that's the owner and the guy had to be hospitalized uh, because of the injuries suffered from being gored by this bull. 
And even in the hospital, when they were talking to him, he was trying to sort of you know, mentally get around the idea that, you know, this is a different organism. Even though they're genetically identical, the expression of genes is going to be unique for every individual. Uh, so they're still not identical. So that's just sort of interesting stuff uh, about cloning. All right, now let's get into CRISPR. Uh, this is a super like white hot topic uh, in biology because it has sort of tremendous capacity for changing how things are done in biology. So let's sort of start at the beginning. Back in the early to mid 80s, researchers were able to uh, begin to sequence the genomes of different species. Now at the time, it took years, huge amounts of money, cooperation from, from people all over the world, and so hard, hardly anything had its genome sequenced. Uh, the human species didn't have its genome sequenced until around the year 2000. So here we are early 80s or mid 80s, and um, the sequence of E. coli had been um, elucidated. They, they, they sequenced the DNA of E. coli. Now at, um, I think it was Kyoto University, uh, this researcher Ish, uh, Ishino, um, in uh, analyzing the DNA, noticed that there were these repeated sequences in DNA. And that in between the repeated sequences, there were sort of these unique uh, sequences. They called them spacers. Okay. So again, all, all we knew at this point, didn't know what it was, didn't know its relevance. Um, in, the, in his paper, he wrote, okay, there are these little sequences that get repeated. And in between them are these spacers that are all sort of different. Okay. Now let's uh, flash forward just a little bit. And what they had found in the subsequent years is that lots of prokaryotes had this same sort of scenario, not just E. coli, where you have these repeated sequences and interspersed between them are these spacers that are sort of unique sequences. So lots and lots of prokaryotes have this. Uh, so since this was recurring in, again and again, they gave it a name. It's a clustered, regularly spaced, short palindromic repeat. Thankfully, they just go with the acronym CRISPR, okay? So the idea of CRISPR is that you have repeated sequences of DNA, and in between them are these spacers with unique sequences of DNA. Okay, let's move ahead to the early 2000s. By the early 2000s, lots of species have had their DNA, DNA sequence, so you can actually start to compare, and you can recognize patterns that are occurring. And what researchers had noticed is that the stuff that uh, Shino had, had recognized, these spacers that are all unique, actually look sort of viral. So when you look at just these spacers, the sequences of DNA resembled sequences of DNA that are found in different viruses. So that seems sort of odd. You know, why would DNA that looks sort of viral in nature show up in bacterial DNA? Another thing they noticed is that when they found these CRISPR segments of DNA, it was always close to another sequence of DNA that coded for this enzyme. It's called a Cas enzyme that does double-stranded cuts in DNA. So if we look here, you know, here's your CRISPR unit, and then just a little upstream of that is the gene for this Cas protein that cuts DNA. So, hmm, thinking of where they're at, we have repeated units of DNA, in between them are segments of DNA that look like viral DNA, and that's close to genes uh, for making a protein that actually cuts the DNA. Well, what the heck does all this lead to? Well, in 2005, they finally sort of cracked the code on that and figured it out. This is bacterial defenses. This is a really cool form of an immune system that is heritable. Bacteria can pass on their uh, immunological memory to their descendant cells. So here's, here's how it works. Remember, viruses can infect bacteria. And what viruses typically do is inject their DNA into the bacterial cell. They sort of hijack the bacterial ribosomes, make copies of the virus viral particles, and then they blow up the cell and go spread to more bacteria. Well, remember, bacteria have restriction enzymes. So if they have the right restriction enzymes, they can cut up the viral DNA. What the bacterial cells do with those little segments of chopped up viral DNA is they actually keep them like little viral mugshots. 
they'll keep the little snippets of viral DNA and insert it in between these repeating units. So these little spacers are actually bits of viral DNA that have been collected from viruses that the bacterial cells have killed. Now, when you also combine that with the Cas protein, what you're able to do is transcribe the viral DNA into this CRISPR RNA. And RNA is single-stranded, right? So the bases are exposed. When you combine this, what's called a guide RNA, with the uh, Cas protein that cuts up DNA, what you basically do is have a surveillance machine. You go and you have this RNA that's looking for subsequent viral genetic information that matches. If it shows up again, the Cas protein can ch ch chop it up and then destroy that virus. So in that way, if a bacterial cell survives, it will recognize the viral protein in the future. And then its descendants, if they're exposed to the same virus, they have this sort of immunological memory and machinery for cutting up the viral DNA. Absolutely amazing. I mean, that's super, super cool. Now, this was figured out in 05. Um, oh, shoot. I think I just sort of talked through uh, what I've got written down here. So again, um, if you cut up the viral DNA with like restriction enzymes, you take the little viral snippets of DNA, insert it into the CRISPR sequence, then you can transcribe that into RNA and combine it with the Cas protein. And then you've got the, the RNA nucleotides that are exposed. They can find uh, viral genetic information on subsequent exposure, and then the Cas protein can cut it up. So super cool. Now, in 2012, uh, Jennifer Doudna, uh, her nickname is The Dude. I mean, way back in like, I don't know, early 2000s, there's a, a movie called The Big Lebowski, and the main character is called The Dude. So her name is Doudna, but uh, she used to be called The Dude quite a bit. Well, anyway, her lab showed that, hey, you know, this guide RNA, couldn't we just sort of put whatever RNA we want in there? And in that way, we could recognize any DNA sequence we want. And in that way, we could just cut DNA wherever we want. Turns out, in a lot of cases, that works. So with CRISPR-Cas9, with this system, you can actually insert whatever guide RNA you want. You can create this guide RNA. You add it to the Cas protein. And then that allows you to go and cut DNA wherever you're interested in. Uh, and then what you can do is actually insert a therapeutic gene directly uh, into the DNA. So this is absolutely remarkable. Um, what you can do with this, I think it's like $75. <laughs> it costs like 75 bucks. You can get your guide, guide RNAs uh, ordered and then they'll get shipped to you. And then you can get, go do experiments and cut DNA wherever you like. So just the, the democratization of this, the capacity of labs to go and Basically, you can you can knock out any gene you want. You can insert genes that you want. Now, this is not 100% effective, uh, but um, it does allow for unbelievable capacity for genome editing. So the idea of genome editing is you can cut the DNA wherever you like. You can cut out whatever gene you want, right? If you, if you have some gene and you cut right in the middle of it, you basically knocked out that gene. And then you can insert whatever gene you want. So the thought is, if you have... Uh, single gene mutation uh, diseases like Huntington disease, uh, like sickle cell disease, um, like cystic fibrosis, you can use this sort of editing capacity to destroy the damaged gene and then basically insert a therapeutic gene. Um, there have been uh, some people who have had some uh, genome editing uh, testing done, and with some of it, you know, it's worked so far. Um, now, this is not uh, without uh, controversy, certainly, um, because the idea is you can take a human embryo and you can cut out any genes you want and then insert genes that you want. Um, uh, there's internationally sort of a moratorium on this, but in 2019, there were reports um, out of a, a lab in China where uh, twin girls 
had actually been born, and there was a third kid since then, that have been born with their genomes edited. Um, now, this, again, has all sorts of problems because, the, like, the parents were lied to and they didn't get uh, full disclosure of what was going on. But the researcher's goal was basically to, to knock out uh, a certain protein. Um, there is a, a protein on the surface of cells that basically allows the HIV virus to dock and then infect cells. So there are certain people that are born without that protein. And so they're basically immune to HIV. So what this researcher wanted to do was create these genome edited children that basically had the gene for producing this protein that allows HIV in the cells. Uh, if that gene gets knocked out, then theoretically the kids would be immune to HIV. Uh, so um, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, the problem uh, or a, a big hurdle with this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system is what's called off-site cuts. Uh, you know that you want the uh, Cas protein to cut DNA at a certain sequence, but sometimes uh, you can have these off-target cuts that cut DNA somewhere else. So you could actually cut out important genes or destroy important genes uh, in an organism, which isn't a huge deal when you're dealing with bacteria, but when you're you know, doing this with a human life, that that's profound, right? So uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is really fascinating, has all sorts of uh, possibility. Um, just last year in 2020, uh, Doudna and another researcher um, were given the Nobel Prize. I mean, in 2012 when this came out, everyone's like, okay, it's just a matter of time until uh, she gets the Nobel for this. But it was uh, in 2020, it was announced that she got the Nobel Prize for figuring out this CRISPR-Cas9 system. So it's really cool. So, uh, again, all sorts of things that can be done with uh, genome editing. Uh, again, you can cut out any gene you want, insert any gene you want, and uh, cause these sort of profound changes uh, in life. So, you guys are going to be dealing with some real stuff uh, in the coming decades. Um, here's just uh, some footage. Uh, this is absolutely remarkable, actually showing uh, CRISPR cutting DNA. So let's see if we can get this to run. All right, so there's the Cas protein. Uh, I don't think it shows it until maybe the end. Either on one end or the other here, the DNA gets cut. Oop, oh, shoot, I ran by it. So it looks like it gets cut here, and then you see the DNA strand separating. There it is. Amazing, right? To actually see this process occurring where this Cas protein snips the DNA and then you create this double-stranded break. So uh, pretty remarkable stuff. Okay, well, uh, that is that. Um, oh, I also included a link to uh, a TED Talk from Jennifer Doudna. Uh, if you're really interested in this, uh, you can hear firsthand from her uh, sort of what the experience is like. So I didn't want to take the time of the lecture, uh, but if you want to watch that, uh, it's really good. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day. Thank you so much.